going to cover a lot of broad uh, shoulder topics, and then we can dive into whichever one's pertaining. Look at the, uh, looking at you guys, I'll skip over a lot of the sports and throwing over use kind of stuff. Um, unless somebody has a big interest in it, then uh, we, can, we can slow down. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the big things with shoulders is there, you don't have to have an injury to have shoulder pain, okay? So, I mean, you can certainly, you know, kind of have a fall, land on your shoulder, then we think one way. But it doesn't mean that you can't just wake up one day with shoulder problem and have a significant issue in there that's been going on over time. Um, they can be related to your job, they can be related to your activities, they can be related to um, you know, so, some of the things you're doing around the house. And then obviously, um, the, the traumas are, are a different story. And then sometimes we just don't know what caused them, um, but that doesn't stop us from trying to um, fix the problem. So um, just from a literature stage, usually our literature kind of draws a line at 40 years old. Um, so if you're below 40, we're supposed to think about certain things, and you're above 40, you're supposed to think about other things. But um, you know, most of us, at least I don't think that way. You, you kind of put you in a category, um, but I don't go by actual age, because you can see this gentleman here is gonna be treated different than most people his age, and, um, and, and same thing with her. So you know, age is just one guideline. I don't go by chronological age, like how old you actually are. It's more your activity age and the things you wanna do. Um, so, you know, the younger we think more about instability, like, you know, make sure your shoulder's not coming out of place, um, you know, how tight the capsule is, which relates to that. And then as we get a little bit older, we worry more about um, arthritis and rotator cuff tears. So you can see there's a ton of problems with the shoulder. The highlight, the ones we, we highlighted here, are the ones we'll hit on, um, but there are, and this is just uh, a few, there's a lot more. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the shoulder. Um, the shoulder's the most mobile joint in the body, um, so there's a lot more problems that can go with it than, than other joints. So in order to understand what's going on in your shoulder, what problems you have, and what we need to do to fix it, we kind of have to understand what the shoulder is and kind of the anatomy. So you know, on the left here are the big muscles you see when you look in the mirror. So you can see the pec is in the front there and the deltoid and the bicep, all those big muscles. Rarely are they an issue, okay? Rarely do you come in and see me and have a problem with one of these muscles. Now it could be a tendon unit attached to these, but the muscles usually are fine. Most of the problems underlie those, so you can point to those, but the structures underneath are typically the ones that are a problem. So if we look over onto the right side of the of the slide, we can see, you know, these are the this is the rotator cuff. And the biggest thing we're going to talk about rotator cuff is this muscle up here. That's the supraspinatus. Um, that's the, the main culprit with rotator cuff problems. There's also one called an infraspinatus, which kind of comes up around the back here and acts similarly. This subscapularis tendon in the front um, is less common, and, and Terry's minor, the one in the back, is almost unheard of to be a problem. It's usually the supraspinatus, which is up top. So if we look and then we strip those down and we get underneath the rotator cuff, then we have this capsule that I mentioned before. This is the sac that holds the fluid, and there's three ligaments in the front and two in the back that actually help hold the shoulder stable. And we get rid of that and go underneath, and then that's where the actual shoulder joint is. And you can see, here's the ball, and here's the socket. And then that's where the ring of cartilage is, is the labrum that goes around it, and that's the first line of stability. So the athletic shoulder we talked about, really what I want to get out of this is, you know, when we talk athletes and we hear labrum, the labrum is that ring of cartilage that goes around the socket. So you have the ball going into the socket, and that labrum kind of acts as a bumper to keep the shoulder out of place. Now that is an issue with younger patients. When I say younger, I'm talking about, you know, teens, 20s, because what happens is if you have a problem with the labrum, you lose some stability in your shoulder and your shoulder can slide around a little bit. As we get a little bit older, that becomes less important. So rarely do I have patients um, that have labral tears that are in their 70s, 80s that are of any consequence. Usually by that point, your, your labrum is a non-issue. Even if you have a tear in it, it is not a big pain generator and, and, and your shoulder will be um, stable even without your labrum. So shoulder impingement I'll cover up is this can happen for anyone. And this is the most common thing I see with the shoulder. So this is kind of you overdid it one day, you woke up and your shoulder's sore, you have trouble picking it up, you can't sleep on it at night, um, and just doing any kind of movement hurts it. That's, that's typically the 
you know, there's a, a constellation of problems that starts with rotator cuff tendonitis and impingement and works its way up to a rotator cuff tear. Um, so really we talk about, you know, you have a roof bone that sits on top of your bone, that's on top of your shoulder, it's called the acromion. That's what you push to when you feel your collarbone come out and then at the end of the collarbone there's a hard bone up top, that's the acromion. And there's three types. So it's flat, it's curved, or it's spiked. Um, you're born with that. It's not something you don't have a bone spur that typically grows you know, as you get older. It kind of stays one of those morphologies. So, um, but you can see if it's flat, you have more room for error. If it's curved, which 85% of people are, you have a little bit less. And then the type threes, or those hooked ones, tend to give people problems. So when I see that on an x-ray, I'm a little bit more concerned about the rotator cuff. Um, but that's the one where you sleep on it wrong. And what you do is you end up pushing the rotator cuff this rotator cuff tendon and pinching it between its attachment bone and the acromion, which is the roof bone. And then it inflames the bursa, it inflames the tendon, and then that muscle senses that and it shuts down. When that shuts down, then it makes it difficult for it to do its job. It has two jobs. You can see that it comes across and attaches here. So when it goes to pull, it lifts your arm up like that. That's one job. The other job is when you lift your arm up, it's meant to pull the head down, right here, the humeral head down, to clear this. So that's one of the things, like if you reach your arm and you kind of get stuck here, it's because it's not doing its job and it's hitting the roof bone. And that's what we call impingement, okay? Um, we'll go over treatments a little later, but the treatments for this typically is not too real. It's just some anti-inflammatories to get that inflammation down, some physical therapy to get that muscle back, and then we can do an injection. The only time we would consider surgery for this is if you exhausted all of those all those treatments and you just weren't getting better. The surgery is a cleanup job. What you go in is just kind of shave down this bone spur and clean up something, clean up the bursa and clean up the debris to kind of give you more room for error. But we try to get you back to your normal mechanics before we would consider doing that. Um, AC, this is almost always trauma. This is pretty easy. You had a fall, you get up, and you see this big bump sitting up here. Um, so that, that's an easy one. You kind of self-diagnose. Most people self-diagnose when they come in. It's either you broke your collarbone or you have this AC joint separation, and that's an easy diagnosis there. So labral tears we went over a little bit. Um, instability, the labral tears um, go hand in hand. Uh, we'll skip over the uh, athletic shoulder stuff. Uh, this is the big one, rotator cuff tears. Okay, so like I said, difficulty reaching up over your head because that part is no longer there. You can see, here's the tendon coming over, there's a tear. Now when that muscle wants to pull, it can't pull on anything. So you're not really lifting up your arm effectively. Yes? Doctor, would you mind going back to the previous slide? Just sure. For a second? Yep. Sorry. The, yeah, the, in the instability, the numbness yep. and the tingling, that's the thing. Okay. So, so yeah, so for instability, we see that in instability, and like I said, when we have athletes that have shoulder instability where their shoulder's coming out of place, when that shoulder comes out of place and it comes out far enough, it can, that head can it bump into a nerve, and that nerve will give numbness and tingling. Now, without instability, you can have numbness and tingling come down your arm. It doesn't mean you have shoulder instability. The vast majority of numbness and tingling going down your arm is from a pinched nerve, usually from the neck. Rarely does, it come, does a pinched nerve get pinched in the shoulder. That's very rare. The only time it is if the shoulder's dislocated or, or unstable. Thank you. Sure. So you can see that, so that rotator cuff tear, so the pain you'll have is any time you're asking that muscle to work. So if you're sitting here with your elbows at your side, typing, writing, eating like this, not gonna be an issue. Anytime you need to lift the elbow away, rotate the arm, and do this, that's what that muscle does, and it can't because there's a tear there. Um, so you have other muscles that help it a little, so you may physically be able to do that, but it may be painful for you. Um, and then trouble sleeping is a big one with that, as far as weakness, because obviously the parts are not attached. The other thing is shoulder arthritis. So this is an, another big issue. So shoulder arthritis, in the grand scheme of arthritis, you know, we see uh, knee arthritis is much more common as far as needing surgical repair. Uh, hip arthritis and then shoulder arthritis are kind of even. And the reason is we're not weight bearing on our arms, we're not walking around on our arms. So you, most people can get further along without needing a shoulder replacement or any kind of advanced treatment for shoulder arthritis because you're not using it as much as the lower extremity. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't get to a point where it really hurts and inhibits what you're doing daily. So shoulder arthritis, not like the rotator cuff where if you sit here like this and just do this, a lot of times shoulder arthritis can hurt all the time. You don't have to be doing anything. You can just be sitting there because the pain from a shoulder arthritis is from the bones rubbing. So if we look here, you can see an x-ray up at the top left, that's a normal looking x-ray. You have the humerus, which is the ball, the scapular neck here that goes to the glenoid, which is the socket, 
Here's the roof bone that we talked about, and here's your collarbone. You can see that space in there. That space is not really space. That space is cartilage. So when you have good cartilage rubbing on good cartilage, there's no real pain to be had. And once you wear that cartilage down, then you get close to the bone. So you can see here, this cartilage is starting to break down and getting exposed to the bone. That will start hurting. Then eventually what happens is that wears out, and then you get an x-ray that looks like this, where you can't see the space or the joint because you're rubbing your bone on bone, and all that cartilage is gone. So that's with the promise. Now, so that will limit your motion because you can see you won't have a nice smooth ball and socket. You'll almost have like sandpaper rubbing and it'll grind and crunch and it'll limit your motion. Then the muscles can't work properly because it can't pull across it. So instead of rolling a ball on a surface, you're almost like trying to roll a block on the surface. And that can be very painful and it can inhibit your function. Okay. <clears throat> So how do we diagnose these problems? Um, the first thing is a history. I can get a lot just from talking to you. A couple minutes, one minute. You just tell me a story of kind of what's been going on. Already I kind of have three or four things in mind of what's going on. Kind of like what, you, you know, what your normal day consists of, how this started, where your pain is. And, um, and then exam. There's a ton of exams for the shoulder. Okay, so the big thing is putting your story together uh, with what I think those things are and then doing a focused exam which can hone it down to one or two things. Um, but it's tough to do these things over the phone. Um, you can get close, but without you know, a physical exam, for the, especially since the shoulder, since it's so um, variable. The shoulder, like I said, is the most mobile joint in the body. There's a ton of things that go on the shoulder. It's not, uh, it's not as, uh, I feel, as easy as a, as a knee to diagnose. So usually when you first come in, the x-ray is the first line because we can get a lot from an x-ray, especially in a shoulder. You know, very different if I get an x-ray that looks like that top left versus the top right. This is a shoulder that's dislocated and out of place. Very different than a shoulder that has end-stage arthritis over there on the right, okay? So depending on what the x-rays show, and your story, as well as the exam, will determine where we need to go next. If it's something that's really straightforward, um, then we can go ahead with the treatment phase. If there's something that I think that there's, you're somewhere on a gradient, then what I would do is get a sense from you how important, how quickly you want this to go away, because the next step could be a, a CAT scan, an ultrasound, or an MRI. Okay. Usually we use MRIs for the shoulders the most because the x-rays give us a lot of the bony information, but the MRI gives us a lot of the soft tissue information. So that soft tissue information, you know, you, saw, you see the x-ray up there. All, the only thing you can see is the ball socket, the roof bone, collarbone, the ribs. You don't see all the soft tissue, and the soft tissue makes up the majority of the shoulder. And they're the ones we, we worry about the most. So that's why the MRI helps us a lot. And you can see on the MRI, this is an MRI just cutting you into axial slices, meaning this is cutting this patient in like this, and we're looking down from the top in little sheets. So here's the ball, here's the socket, here's the labrum, there's a labral tear right there, the fluid's leaking right through. This is cutting the patient into slices this way and looking from front to back. We see the ball, the socket, here's the rotator cuff muscle, tendon, tendon, no tendon, big tear in the rotator cuff right there. Um, so very easy to tell on an MRI and that helps us tremendously. The question is sometimes, you know, we'll ask to put a dye injection in. Really that is a little bit more beneficial usually in younger patients where you're looking for subtle things. Um, and the reason for it is when you inject the dye, it goes all through the shoulder and then it pushes structures out of the way, like the labrum. It'll push the labrum away and it'll leak in. Or if we're worried about a partial thickness rotator cuff, a little scuffing, the dye will leak into that and light that up so you won't miss as much. But if you're worried about just is the rotator cuff torn or not, you do not need the dye for that. So um, treating shoulders, it's, it's not a, a slam dunk, say you have this problem, this is the treatment, go do this, and it's a cookie cutter plan. Everyone's a little bit different. Every shoulder's a little bit different, even if you have a rotator cuff a little bit different. You can see if, if both of these guys would have a rotator cuff tear, you could see why um, the treatment for each of these guys may be a little bit different. We may, um, you know, we may rehab one, inject one, or we may fix the other. We uh, would hand tailor a physical therapy program for this top guy versus, versus um, the bottom guy, or uh, vice versa. And plus, like, what do you want to get out of the shoulder? What are you looking to get back to do? All these things are factors in how, what we set the treatment plan and how we uh, accomplish our treatment goals. So uh, we'll do the, this is for instability stuff, but for rotator cuff tears, depending on what the rotator cuff looks like, our options are physical therapy, injections, um, or, or surgery, whether, you know, arthroscopic um, with little bioabsorbable anchors like was done there on the bottom. So you take that top tear, you can see that here's the rotator cuff up here. There's the ball, we're looking at it from the side. 
this should all be attached down to here, okay? And it's ripped off, so when you're pulling this way, the muscle's pulling it this way, you're not gonna get much action. But what we do is grab this back down and fix it back over this bone and then hold that there until it heals. Now, every rotator cuff's different. So it's not like when we go in, it's the same surgery every time. Um, because there are very, these are the main categories, but they're all different. You can see you can have a little crescent one where all we have to do is tack that back down. We can have an L-shaped tear where we have to bring this flap back to this and fix it in an L-shaped fashion. Um, you can have a trapezoidal one where you have to close down the dead space, or you have these massive tears where you have to crimp and bring it back together before you can reattach it to the bone. So every one of these is different. So when you say, oh, I know a friend who's had a rotator cuff repair, I know this, every one is different. So it's a big difference if you have a little pinhole versus you have a massive or you have an L. Yes? A complete tear. Yep. Would that be so these are all complete tears. Anytime that tendon is not touching the bone, it's a complete tear. So, you know, anytime, what we call... Uh, no, I understand all right. So if, if there's a piece of that tendon hanging on, like so sometimes what'll happen is, instead of this being completely off, if I look with a scope from the undersurface, it'll be torn from here, 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 but this is hanging on still, and this is still attached, but under surface you can see there's a tear. That's an incomplete tear, that's a partial thickness tear. And you don't have to operate on those right away. There's not a time constraint with those, but usually that's a, it's a discomfort and a, and a functional problem. Yes, sir? Uh, you said about arthritis of the shoulder here? Yes. Yep, yeah, we're getting to that. So we'll, we'll be there shortly, I think. Um, so as far as, as, um, as fixing these things, um, so or orthopedics is kind of fluid. Everything kind of changes. We used to do them all open. Now as arthroscopic equipment and procedures have gotten better, that's the gold standard now is arthroscopic. Now that's for straightforward repairs. If you need to do cadaver grafts or special things and you're on your third revision, that may not be the case. But as far as you tore your rotator cuff, you need it fixed. I can do a way better job arthroscopically than I can open because I can see a lot better. I can put the scope in. I can look underneath. I can look above. I can see where it's stuck. I can see a release. When you do an open, no matter how big, you make that incision so you know arthroscopically you're just making these little poke holes that's it open you're making an incision you're cutting splitting through the muscles much much bigger deal as far as getting getting those tissues to heal so I prefer the arthroscopic route I feel much better um, able to, to fix a, a tear arthroscopically we also like you asked about the partial tears if you have a partial tear and need it fixed we do not necessarily have to just let this go. We can fix just the torn portion. So like I said before, I can look underneath. We can see there's a hole here, but the rest of that tendon's intact. So I can go in and fix a partial tear without detaching the whole tendon. Um, here, now we're getting to arthritis. So here's the, here's the arthritis part. So like we said before, what's arthritis? Arthritis is the loss of cartilage. So you have the ball, you have the socket, you have the nice cartilage at the end. If you're rubbing the cartilage together, you're gonna, you're gonna be fine. Once you wear that cartilage down, and you can see right here how this is all yellowy and, and grainy, that is exposed bone. That is pure bone right there. You can see, here's a little, this white stuff's a little bit of the cartilage hanging on, but you can see that this is all bone here. That's pretty much bone on bone arthritis. That's end stage arthritis, okay? Once you get to that point, there's no real way to stop your pain until you stop those bones from rubbing. So once those bones stop rubbing, the pain goes away. The only way to really do that is to, is to stop, is to replace it. You have to coat the surface with something. It's like if you have a broken tooth or a chipped tooth and the nerve endings are firing and then you go get a filling and you cap them and the pain goes away, same idea. These nerve endings are firing. Until we stop that from getting stimulated, the pain keeps going. So that's why we talk about replacements. And so you can start, you can ice it, anti-inflammatories. We can try steroid injections, physical therapy, modifying your activity, and we do all those things first, okay? If nothing works, you're still unhappy with your shoulder and can't do the things you want to do, then this is the fix. With joint replacements, I typically don't get very pushy. I'm not saying, you know, I don't come in, I don't look at, no matter how bad your x-rays are, well, if I look at your x-rays and see of arthritis, we talk, I don't push that you have to go do this. It's a quality of life issue. The only time I get pushy is if I start seeing this socket. So 
the socket here, <clears throat> this is what tends to wear out. So if that socket starts wearing out in an abnormal position where you start angling it back or you start wearing through the bone, then your success rate will not be as good for a shoulder replacement because you won't have the bone stock to hold the parts. So that's when I would get a little pushy. If I start seeing that bone angling back or you wearing through it, um, then I'll push you a little bit that you may want to think about doing it sooner than later. So the surgical treatment for this, we can go in and make little poke holes and just debride the joint. Not super helpful. May help for a month or two. I usually don't like putting my patients through a month or two of relief, but you're doing a rehab, you're post-surgical, and then back where you started. Not going to make a whole lot of gains doing that. Um, and then we get into the replacements. Okay, So we can do a humeral head resurfacing, which means we just put the cap on the end of the ball and leave the socket alone. Um, not usually recommended. We don't do that a lot anymore. Um, that's usually for our younger, super active patients that want to be in competitive weightlifting, want to run jackhammers, want to do those type of things. Whereas we can stop the ball-sided pain, but you can still wear the socket because the metal's hitting the socket, but there's not restrictions. When we put the other parts in, there's some restrictions on uh, how much you can do. Like we don't want you doing power weightlifting. We don't want you running jackhammers. We don't want to make you vibratory because when they fail, they fail on the socket side. And so that has no socket side. Then really what it comes down to what the vast majority of patients get is either a shoulder replacement, which is a straightforward shoulder replacement here, or a reverse total shoulder replacement, which is over there. You can see both of these constructs are stopping you can't, you see a space here. That space is not a space. There's a plastic a cap on the end of this bone. So this metal is hitting plastic. It is not hitting that bone. And then over there, you can see there's metal on both sides with a plastic, with a plastic insert in between. So this is a total shoulder replacement because you can see we're cutting the head. We're putting, a, we're matching the ball and putting a metal ball back and then we're shaving the socket and putting a plastic socket back. So that's a shoulder replacement. That's a reverse total shoulder replacement because you can see what we've done here is we've taken the ball and put it on the socket side. We've taken the socket and put it on the ball side. So we've flipped the components. And so that's why it's called a reverse total shoulder. So the premise between that, the, really the big difference is if your rotator cuff works or it doesn't work. If you have a, a rotator cuff that's working fine, you have bad arthritis, you get a regular shoulder replacement because you need that ball to be held in that socket. If we put a ball, a regular ball and socket back in and you do not have a good rotator cuff, that can slide out of place and dislocate or it leaves you with a non-functioning shoulder. So in cases of that, what we do is we do the reverse total shoulder. And the reason that works is because if you can see, here's where the ball meets the socket here. The ball meets the socket, that's the point of rotation right there. So what happens is the rotator cuff comes over and attaches to here. So when you want this to work, it rotates here and the rotator cuff pulls here, which lifts the arm. Now, if you don't have a rotator cuff to work, we need to move that center of rotation out. So instead of rotating here, we, center, we rotate all the way out here. So that moves the force. You need something out here to pull. And that something is now, instead of being here, is all the way out here is your deltoid. So what the reverse total shoulder does is allow the big muscle outside, the deltoid muscle, to do all the work. Okay. Now the difference is this is a pretty high demand. You can get back to doing almost anything within reason that, other than the things we talked about before. You can get back to doing most things with, the, with this. When you do a reverse total shoulder, you're not really doing the heavy things anymore. It's not a high demand implant. Okay, So you're not going to be doing the heavy work typically. Um, but that's, these are the two main treatments that we use for shoulder arthritis at this point, And they have um, pretty good results if you choose the right parts for the right patient. Excuse me? Yes. So when you do a, um, that kind of treatment, do you need any kind of surface between the ball and the, I think you said plastic, it's a metal ball and plastic. Do you need something that keeps it lubricated or is, is that a smooth enough? Yeah, so it's a smooth enough service. Your body will provide the lubrication. So in your current joints now, you have joint fluid in all your joints. Even after we replace it, your body will provide that. Okay. Every joint replacement we do, knees, hips, shoulders, all have some type of product, either metal or ceramic, rubbing on plastic. Okay. We've had, we have some metal on metal things, but they're a little rare. We've had some problems with hips with the metal on metal, but the metal or ceramic on plastic is, is almost every joint replacement in the body. Is there any 
cushion that is ever put in there, some kind of a sponging? No, they tried that early on. They tried cadaver graphs, human graphs, um, uh, allograph transfers, meaning taking cadaver transfers or transfers. None of that has worked. Yeah, so the replacement's still the main mainstay treatment for this. Question. Yeah. <coughs> is your shoulder mobility the same for either of those two? So, so <clears throat> when we do these, we try, we don't advertise. The main reason we do this is for pain relief. That's the number one reason. You know, if you're in a lot of pain, we fix this. You can get your motion back and you can get your strength back, but that's not the number one goal. It's the pain. Now, with this type of procedure, usually your preoperative motion dictates to us how you're going to do afterwards. If you come in and you need a regular shoulder replacement, your rotator cuff's working fine, and you come in stuck like this, we could probably get you to 90, maybe 100. I doubt we're getting you to 180. It happens, but I, I, not, not commonly. Now, if you come in with full motion and you just have a ton of pain with arthritis, then you typically get that back afterwards. This is where we see the biggest improvement because we're doing this in people that don't have rotator cuffs. So typically, people come in and need that. They're doing this. They're doing this. The rotator cuff's not working. They have arthritis. Then all of a sudden we do that and their pain goes away and you're asking the deltoid to do the work. So now those parts that you haven't had for years are now that workload is getting offset to a different muscle group that can do the work. So you can see a much bigger jump in your motion and strength with that prosthesis. Now that's not what we advertise. That's not what we're, we're, we're supposed to say. It's for pain relief, but you do see that nice side effect from that. Yes? With the reversal, what restrictions, once it's done and you're through all your therapies, are there restrictions on what you do with it? Yeah, so the, you know, the not, I, I don't usually give much, you know, I have people doing all kinds of stuff with this. I have people that are doing still tough mutters and doing that kind of stuff with you. The reverse total shoulder stuff, we don't like that. Now the main limitation of the prosthesis is you lose some of the internal rotation, which is going back. So a lot of people, you know, you can't get up here. Usually you can help yourself with bathroom duties, but you can't get up much higher. And that's a limitation of the, of the reverse because you sacrifice this for more of this. And most people, if you ask them, they would rather have more of this than, than this. Um, but, you know, it, it's fine. And usually, you know, the ideal patient for the reverse is somebody, and I said I don't use ages, but just to give you guys a general, is they're in their 70s and 80s that aren't going to go out and, you know, chopping wood and running wood and doing the heavy stuff. Um, now, I do do it in people that do it, but it's just some, a conversation we have to have because it's not made for the wear and tear. Everyday, normal everyday things, walking around shopping, eating, going to bed, you know, doing stuff. If you're going to do heavy, vigorous work, we have to have a really good talk about what your expectations are. Like taking a gallon. Oh, that stuff's fine. Yeah, yeah that's perfectly fine. It would be more like doing, running hammers and doing drywall and doing ceiling work. And, you know, but if you want to do things like everyday things around the house, not an issue. Yes? No, so completely different. So that is calcific tendonitis. So what happens at some point, you get an injury to the rotator cuff, maybe something you don't even know about. And you get a little, little irritation within the tendon. And instead of your body healing that up, it puts a little calcium in there. And then it can proliferate. So then you get this calcium deposit within one of the tendons. So if you get an x-ray, you can see it. You don't even need an MRI to see that. You can see it on an x-ray. So now you've got a ball of calcium in there. The problem with that is it's kind of laying in wait. So Maybe it goes away over time, but usually what happens is you do something one day and that calcium is like the consistency of toothpaste. And so what happens is it squirts out and then your body attacks it like a foreign body. So you get a huge inflammatory response. It hurts like heck. And then you can do a cortisone shot to flash out the inflammation, a little therapy, uh, and you'll do okay for maybe a couple days. But if that calcium is still coming out, that will not go away. Um, so then the next treatment, if that keeps happening as a cycle, then we just go in with the little poke holes and we scoop the, that calcium out and clean that out. And that usually does the trick. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, I mean, that's pretty much it for um, the, the, the common shoulder stuff.